The agenda this week debated whether the time had come to negotiate with Russia to end the war in Ukraine, assess the merits of so-called finfluencers on social media, and asked if aiming for smart cities was a wise goal. The agenda's week in review begins examining the state of Canadian federalism. That, that initial document, the Free Alberta Strategy, talked about ignoring federal court decisions, and it talked about invalidating federal laws. Um, since then, Ms. Smith has climbed down, um, and, and so now we're waiting to see, and it sounds like we won't find out until after she's elected. She's, she's currently running for her seat in Brooks in a rural riding, and, and, and sounds like we won't actually get to see the details of what she's proposing and whether or not it is, it is in fact, something significant or if it's really just sort of more angry letter writing. Um, but, I, you know, I think it's, um, it's really important to point out that not a lot of people understand just how radical the proposal was, that it essentially did suggest that the, that the legislature, not the courts, but the legislature would decide which laws are constitutional and which ones aren't. And, and, and I want to say also this idea of, of com creative non-compliance or creative non-enforcement, I think there's a, an important distinction has to be made between not assisting the federal government mm -hmm. in enforcing its priorities and trying to prohibit mm -hmm. the enforcement of those of those policies mm -hmm. and laws right and that's where that's where the sovereignty act really gets into into a bad space and i think similar with the saskatchewan proposal because there have been suggestions at times that it would not just be about not not assisting as we see for instance playing out with the gun buyback sort of policy right now but rather also prohibiting right so that for instance, that the Impact Assessment Act, Bill C-69, would not apply magically within Alberta, or that we wouldn't have to pay a carbon price within Alberta, right? So not just not assisting in enforcement, but actively trying to prohibit or somehow interfere with enforcement. And that, of course, is totally offside. And and, and she can't do that. The Premier, Premier Smith can't do that and stay within the bounds of our current constitutional order. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see what John Ibbotson from the Globe and Mail had to say about all of this. And uh, to that end, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to put up a graphic of his uh, recent writings about this. Here's John Ibbotson in the Globe. Progressives across the country have every reason to support the Trudeau government's record of new social and environmental programs with more action coming on housing, what's not to like? <laughs> Setting aside the fact these programs have contributed to record deficits and increased government debt, there is the cost to national unity. Aggressive federalism takes its toll. Aggressive federalism. Renaud, come on in on this and tell us whether you believe it is in fact the federal government's so-called aggressive federalism that is pushing the prairie provinces to these moves. Oh, absolutely. And I would say it's not just the prairie provinces. I mean, we're still, we're feeling tensions when it comes to the, the equalization program in Newfoundland. Uh, we're seeing uh, a sort of alliance against the carbon tax that we saw with New Brunswick, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Quebec, uh, and Manitoba, and Ontario working on the same court case. So there's a lot of issues where Ottawa's tendency to centralize everything in Ottawa at the expense of the provinces has uh, created this sort of anger and tensions in various areas of the country. I think now uh, it's showing its head much more uh, publicly out west uh, with Western alienation, with these proposals. But it's by no means over in Quebec. The same the same sort of issues are still are still there in Quebec, and Quebec still wants to uh, be respected as part of the as part of the federation. And it just it goes to show that when the federal government sort of tries to impede to to uh, impose itself into areas of provincial jurisdictions. Uh, we've seen it with health care. We've seen it with child care. We are now seeing it with dental care. We're seeing it with the Impact Assessment Act. It's progressively eroding uh, the level of trust that the provinces have in the federal government as an equal partner. I just heard Natalie de Rosier say under her breath, no. Uh, well, <laughs> so, uh, that, what do you mean? that is this inerrant in the federalism uh, structure that you will have uh, aggressive uh, decision making or aggressive uh, legislation being pushed forward, taking the vacuum, you know. So taking the lead on childcare uh, may actually support and, and respect uh, provinces actually making their own deal. So, so the, there always was an attention in Canadian federalism between uh, uh, the centralization being kind of forward looking, social investment, uh, environment protection. Uh, being a, a good example of how important it is to have probably a national policy if you're serious about climate change. But, you know, and then at the same time being what we called the, the laboratory of provincial uh, policymaking that actually 
emulate each other or push a little further, and some provinces will be ahead of, of others and will be ahead of the federal government. It does create, I agree with Renaud, it's inerrant that there's tensions. It's been like this since uh, 1867. Mm -hmm. Howard, how about you on that Ibbotson quote? Do you think aggressive federalism is what's uh, prompted some of this? Uh, I, I absolutely think it's prompted some of this, uh, and a couple of examples have been uh, mentioned already. Um, one is uh, C-69, the Impact Assessment Act. Uh, that is an example where the federal government uh, was very high-handed in uh, exercising its um, jurisdiction over environment, which we should remember is a shared constitutional jurisdiction, mm -hmm. but it used its uh, powers to, um, to claim jurisdiction over projects that are entirely uh, within a single province. And Alberta pushed back on that, and they actually won uh, the mm -hmm. Alberta Court of Appeal, declared uh, some aspects of that law unconstitutional. Mm -hmm. We'll see how that goes up to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, but that, that's a clear example of high-handed uh, federal government policy, where even the uh, Senate, with a liberal appointed majority at the time, recommended to the government that it amend that legislation to remove some of those um, more egregious intrusions onto provincial jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And the federal government just ignored the Senate. Um, and another is child care. Um, I mean, the recent child care is one of those examples of uh, what's called uh, cooperative federalism, where I think a lot of provinces, including Alberta, were asking cooperation, <laughs> but cooperation on the federal government's terms is all that's being offered. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, I mean, a one size fits all or even a margin of provincial, I don't know, negotiation being permitted, it's just wholly constitutionally inappropriate. I mean, this is a clear area of provincial jurisdiction. There's no way the federal government could legislate in this area. And yet they try and legislate indirectly by attaching conditions to these transfers, which are not federal money, particularly in a case of a province like Alberta. This is money that's taxed. Um, uh, the tax base is coming from Alberta. It goes to Ottawa, it goes back, and it comes back with conditions. And when those conditions are in an area of core provincial jurisdiction, uh, that's absolutely inappropriate. And I think the province has a right to push back and say, this is none of your business. Well, uh, but in a way, the federal spending power, and that's what we're talking about, mm -hmm. there is always a, a question. It's been for a long time about whether you could impose conditions or not on the money. The money is being taxed across Canada. It's not coming from Alberta. It comes from the taxpayers, and it goes to the federal government. And then it says, if you want my money, you're going to have to obey by the conditions. Okay. And, and people but, fight back, I, I, fight back. I, I, and I agree I, with you. It has been an irritant the, for a long time. Yeah. You, you say my money is those the federal government's money, and I would push back and say no, it's not. This is uh, this is money that is collected by the federal government, but the fact that the government collects the money is not of constitutional significance, or shouldn't be, and shouldn't allow it then to interfere in areas of provincial jurisdiction. And and I think this is an area where the provinces are actually starting to say this may have been the way we've done it for 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years, but we don't we're going to yeah. Let, let let let's quote draw the line. This is a moment. Nearly eight months into this war, is it time to start negotiating with Putin for a potential end to this war? George Beebe, start us off, please. Yes, I think it is time to start negotiating with Putin on this. You know, President Biden a few weeks ago warned that uh, we were on, on course toward a direct U.S.-Russian military conflict. He worried about what uh, Putin might do if he's cornered. And I think he was right to worry about that. Um, we're, we're headed toward that kind of direct collision. Um, and that's a very dangerous thing. And I think the only way you get out of that uh, escalatory spiral is by talking. That's the way that uh, Kennedy handled the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, almost exactly 60 years ago. And that's what I think we need to do today. Melinda Herring, your view. Steve, it's not time yet, and it's up to the Ukrainians. So George and I are longtime debate partners, and I have the same problem with his statement that I always have with his statements. Ukraine has agency, and Ukraine gets to decide when it wants to negotiate. And the Ukrainians are not interested in negotiating, and the Russians are not interested in negotiating at this point. Medea Benjamin. Uh, the Russians are certainly interested in negotiating. I think they're desperate to negotiate. Uh, and I think the U.S. has a lot to say in this because without U.S. weapons, uh, the Ukrainians would not be able to put up this kind of fight. I think it's totally irresponsible that President Biden is not talking to Putin, that Secretary Blinken is not talking to Lavrov. The time is not only now, the time was long, uh, many months ago. It should have happened before the war started when the U.S. dismissed 
uh, Russia's entreaty to negotiate, uh, and it should happen immediately. Otherwise, we're in a lose-lose situation for the whole world. Colonel Kansian. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be any common ground between the two sides. The Ukrainians uh, want to reclaim all of their territory. Not surprisingly, the Russians haven't shown any indication uh, of a willingness to withdraw. Uh, and once you start negotiations, you build an expectation that you're about to make a deal, that there's a deal on the table, you just have to find it. The only deal that you could make right now is an in-place ceasefire, and that gives Russia about 18 percent of Ukraine. Okay, thank you for those statements. We now know where the four of you stand on this issue, and let's follow up. George, do you believe, I mean, I understand that you think we should be talking, but do you believe that there are the, the makings of a potential deal right now that both sides could sign on to? Well, it depends on, on how you view the shape of some sort of uh, deal. If you're talking about a territorial settlement, where Ukraine and Russia agree on where the borders of Ukraine will be drawn, then no, there's no prospect of some sort of settlement on that anytime soon. Um, that, that's a zero-sum deal. One side will win, one side will lose uh, to some degree. And I don't think there's any interest on either side in finding that kind of a compromise right now. But that's not what we should be talking about. We need to be talking about the U.S.-Russian strategic relationship how we each can avoid a head-on military collision that has potentially catastrophic implications for everyone involved in this, including the entire world. That's something that Ukraine doesn't get to decide. We should not be outsourcing American national security to Kiev. Uh, the United States and Russia need to be talking about how we handle that issue. Um, and, and that's something that I think uh, can be done. I think the Russians want to talk about that. And the question of where Ukraine's borders are going to be delineated can be handled over time, over a long time. Uh, that's how uh, the Baltic states were handled during the Cold War. The United States never recognized the incorporation of the Baltic states into the Soviet Union. We never have to recognize Russian annexation of any uh, Ukrainian territory. Okay, let me, let me get some feedback. Let me get some about. Let's get some feedback yeah. from some of the other guests on that position. Melinda Herring, uh, okay, they're not going to agree on borders, but talks should still be had because of the broader U.S.-Russian geostrategic potential partnership. What do you say to that? So, Steve, the White House is talking to Moscow. It is false to say that they're not talking. Biden has been very, very clear about nuclear weapons. He said that there will be catastrophic consequences if they're used. And the White House has told the Kremlin what we will do if Vladimir Putin uses nuclear weapons. And he's been very, very clear about that. So it's false to say that we are not talking. Uh, George is playing my favorite game. He's trying to distract us with nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons and a peace deal are two very different things. I think the nuclear threat is serious, but I don't. I, I would assess it at a 5% chance. George would probably assess it higher. I won't put words in his mouth. Uh, but I think the White House has done a very good job of taking the threat seriously. Bottom line, Putin's not going to use nukes, and I'm glad to explain why. Regulation is coming on the whole online you know, education, Finfluencer marketplace. Australia's led the way for a couple of years now, included in the regulation of their licensed financial advisor marketplace. UK, USA, Canada is a bit slower on this. And I think part of what's also good to appreciate is even in the regulated licensed world I'm operating in, mortgages are licensed and regulated different than insurance, which is licensed and regulated different than investment products. Within investment products, there's different licenses, different regulations, different requirements. And in the middle is general financial advice that's largely unregulated. So if you want to talk about goals and cash flow and saving for retirement, really, even in the regulated world, not a lot of people supervising or watching over that. So it, it's even more complicated because it depends on, in Canada, what type of advice you're giving. They're all in different pages. The provinces are even different to some degree. Um, but regulation's coming because even in the license channel, you know, something just came out a few months ago where they're now looking at titles of financial advisors in Ontario. So what I put on my business card, you know, next up's going to be credentials. What are all those credentials mean? I've got eight credentials. Hmm. And if one of them was fake on my business card, you'd never know. Hmm. They're not, but I'm just saying, <laughs> you'd never know. So there's a lot of work to do both in the regulated channel 
And this is just added in, it's coming too. So if you want to get ahead of it, you know, because they can literally shut you down if you, if you don't kind of follow these rules over time. Cavell, let's hear from you on this. Uh, is this coming to Canada and should it? Uh, I think it's definitely on its way. Like Kurt mentioned, Australia is, is a leader in that they've regulated titles for who can call themselves a financial planner or financial advisor for, for a few years now. And, and Canada's in the process of doing that, which is fantastic. Um, definitely agree. And I do believe that there needs to be some regulation, at least in terms of, you know, like we said, what kind of disclaimers are you putting on your online video to indicate, you know, I'm being paid by such and such company um, to recommend this product to you? Or again, you know, making this investment recommendation because it worked for me, but it's not actually advice. Please go do your own research and talk to your financial advisor. So I definitely think it's on its way and I think it's a good thing. Jim, what say you? I totally agree. So I think if you're giving advice on social media that seems questionable. Like it's not education, it's not inspiration, it kind of borders, like you're talking about a stock, you're talking about a ETF, you should make a disclaimer very clear to say that this is not advice, you should consult your financial advisor or some kind of disclaimer like that for sure. I put that everywhere on my social media channels and it's, and it's important, but the fact is 99% of, of people on TikTok, on the new platforms, they don't worry about that stuff, and they and that's a, that's a big problem. So one of the benefits of social media is that you get a lot of access to information, but 99% of that information, I would say, is harmful. Do you, Siobhan, you want the government regulating what you put up on your website? I think it should be regulated if it's in the best interest of the people, because I think within each of our different businesses, people are at the heart of it, and we're trying to help them, and so if, institutions and companies like TikTok and Instagram can also take responsibility for ensuring that we are doing the best we can um, and <laughs> legally, then I think that's a great step to helping us all make sure that we have a level of discernment when it comes to consuming social media. Hmm. Okay, let's, um, let's do, you know, Jim, I wanna talk about Logan Paul. I gotta confess, I didn't know who Logan Paul was before doing this. The so-called mega influencer, Logan Paul. You guys all know who he is? Yes. Sort of. You all know who he is, okay. All right. Anyway, he promoted some obscure cryptocurrency called Dink Doink. You ever heard of this? Yeah. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Am I like totally out of it here? Am yeah, I a little too? bit, a little bit. Okay, Dink Doink, I hadn't heard of before doing the research for this. He's got six million followers and he's promoting it to them, but he didn't disclose, apropos of what you said about uh, Kardashian, didn't disclose an important conflict of interest. He was friends with the creator of the crypto coin, and they'd come up with this idea together, and then the, pl the price of Dink Doink plummets, and he finds himself in hot water. So the question, okay, Jim, come on in this. How common is bad cryptocurrency advice in the Finfluencer world? I think it's rampant. Like last year when I was on TikTok, almost everything in my feed was on promoting a coin or promoting an NFT or promoting something related to NFT, cryptocurrency. That's another one. Hang on, I think Sorry. I might know this one. Non-fungible token. token. Okay, correct. So that was everywhere. And the, it was really bad advice. It was very damaging. But the, the voice and the interest and the hype around it was so big, it was almost inevitable that no one, including regulators, could keep up with it. And a lot of people got hurt. And it's, it's a danger, that's ex exactly why it's dangerous to listen to social media when it comes to different asset classes and, and treating it like advice. All right. We're gonna talk about smart cities. Sure. And I need you to define what they are. Well, a smart city uh, is kind of a buzzword. When we're thinking about like what the, the realm of possibility of what technology could do for us in like 2007, 2008, these new things called smartphones were suddenly just in everyone's pockets and people were thinking, well, what could be smart next? And this group of companies, you know, Siemens, Cisco, IBM, wanted to sort of rewire cities and get things like central command centers to really, you know, kind of make cities a little bit more efficient from like the, uh, the way that they're run. That did not necessarily go over well. There were a lot of cost overruns, a few controversies, places like Songdo in South Korea, uh, it was not necessarily a sort of a great 
uh, you know, successor to the smartphone. Hmm. Um, and then in sort of the mid 2010s, seven or eight years later, uh, there was sort of the social media world and those sort of companies started thinking, well, what can we do for cities? Specifically with this company called Sidewalk Labs that wanted to build a city from the internet up by thinking about cities from what can we do you know, for people? What can we re really make the sidewalk itself a lab? And think about how can we you know, embed technologies to make life better for everyday people. But is there such a thing as a smart city? Not necessarily, because no one's really ever actually built one in a successful way that's been celebrated um, as you know, something that has made life better for people. So Vass, what would it look like sort of on the ground? If you lived in a smart city or a smart neighborhood, you would therefore what? Well, I guess if we think of smart cities in that binary way that you're either a smart city or you're not, that's where it kind of falls down, right? Because what we're pointing to is the application, targeted application of particular technologies that are meant to enhance our civic life, uh, uh, manage traffic better, manage garbage disposal better, help kind of flow people through a city, try, try to learn from everything that's going on inside a city to, to make cities arguably better, more efficient, better run. So what would it mean if we were living in one? I mean, ideally, you wouldn't necessarily know. Hmm. I, not in the sense that it's deceptive, but everything but would, would be better. a little bit smoother. Got yeah. It. As you look at a map of the world, can you point to a dot anywhere that says, oh, that's a smart city. They're doing all of those things. Well, there are, I mean, as Josh mentioned, there are places that self-describe as smart cities, like Songo, mm -hmm. uh, South Korea. And um, there, are, you know, there are cities that have invested a lot of money in these technologies. Uh, but I think that the the thing about the smart city label is that it it's actually quite constrained. And, and what cities are is much bigger than that, much more complicated and more uh, resilient to and defiant about the imposition of a set of technologies. Um, and so I think that that's why it's difficult to actually say, OK, well, this is a great working example. Hmm. Does the idea appeal to you, though? I think that um, I think that it's an overly narrow set of solutions to um, the nature of the of urban life, right? It's, uh, you know, I was in Mexico City a couple of weeks ago. It's 22 million people. There are an incredible number of things going on all at the same time. It's a very vibrant place. And I was walking around thinking, there's no way that you could actually kind of come up with an inventory of technologies that manage that space. And, you know, that's a good thing, I think. You prefer the sort of more organic I, way of Yeah, I, I believe in the notion of messy urbanism and that <laughs> it, it's that cities were not meant to be kind of ma managed in a rational way like that. Vast, mm. does the notion of a smart city appeal to you, generally speaking? Uh, elements of a smarter city certainly appeal to me. And I think we hear that from citizens now and then, but not always articulated in that way. So, for instance, with something like uh, speed cameras that we're starting to get used to. Uh, we have expectations that this will be a more kind of efficient, effective application of, you know, equitably penalizing people who speed in certain areas. And then as we learn more about them, we realize that they come with additional costs. There's a human element to this. We have to send uh, tickets within 30 days. Uh, sometimes these are turned off. So, you know, the idea that a technological intervention is a substitute for uh, governance, oversight, humans for people in some way, I think that's where it falls apart. Would I like to be able to have my Presto card uh, on my phone so that when I lose it, <laughs> you know, things like that? Like, is that a smart city or is that just a smarter use of technologies that sort of help us get around? I think that's maybe where we can get tripped up in, in some of the conversation. That's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.